This book is dedicated to Anthony Diggle. A truer friend has rarely been known. The Iliad, Book 12 While Patroclus doctored Eurypylus, the battle raged on. The Greeks still had the protection of their trench, and the wide wall above it they had built, as the last line of defense for their ships, for the time being. When they built that wall and drove the trench around it to protect their ships and all their plunder, they neglected to offer formal sacrifice to the immortal gods. Built against the will of the immortals, the wall could not endure for long. While Hector lived and Achilles raged, and the city of Priam was still unpillaged, the great wall of the Greeks stood firm. But when all the best Trojans had died, and many Greeks had fallen or had left, after ten years, Priam's city had fallen, and the Greeks had sailed back to their native land. Then Poseidon and Apollo conspired to sweep away the wall, bringing against it the might of all the rivers that flow down from Ida's mountains to the sea. Rhesus and Heptaporus, Caresus and Rhodius, Granicus and Asepus, Shining Scamander and Simwis, along the banks of which many bullhide ships and helmets fell in the dust, and a generation of men who were half divine. Phoebus Apollo turned all their mouths together, and for nine days sent their flood against the wall. Zeus poured down rain continually, the sooner to wash the wall into the sea. The earth shaker led the way, holding a trident in his hands, and pushed into the waves all the foundations of beams and stones the Greeks had laid with toil. He made all smooth along the mighty Hellespont, and again covered the great shore with sand. The wall was gone. He turned the beautiful rivers back to flow in their original channels. This Poseidon and Apollo were to do in time to come. But now the battle raged on both sides of the well-built wall. The beams rang as they were struck, and the Greeks, whipped back by Zeus, were penned in with their ships, terrified of Hector, who had engineered the rout, and who still fought like a howling wind. When hunters are out with their dogs, their prey, a wild boar or a lion, will suddenly feel its strength and turn. The men close their ranks like a wall, and throw their javelins thick and fast, but the valiant animal stands its ground, and though its bravery will be its death, it charges the ranks of men, testing them, and where it charges, the men fall back. Hector kept urging his troops to cross the ditch. His horses stood at its edge, whinnying but would not advance, spooked by the trench, too broad to leap and too difficult to drive over. The banks hung over the sides, and sharp stakes were planted in the farther, higher edge, a formidable obstacle for a horse and a chariot. But the foot soldiers were eager to give it a try. To that end, Polydamus drew up to Hector and said, Hector and Trojan commanders all, it's not very smart of us to drive our horses across this trench, not with those sharp stakes set in it, and the Greek wall just a little beyond. There's not enough space to dismount and fight, and we'll suffer heavy casualties if we try, if the High Lord of Thunder has turned against them, and it is his will to help the Trojans. I would gladly see the Argives blotted out. But if they rally and we have to retreat and crash into the ditch, there won't be a man left even to bring the news back to the city. So this is what I say we should do. Let the squires hold the horses by the trench, while the rest of us advance on foot in full armor, massed behind Hector. The Greeks will not withstand us if the noose is tight around them. It was sound advice, and Hector took it. He vaulted to the ground in his armor, and the other Trojans followed his example. 
they instructed their drivers to keep the horses in good order by the ditch. The troops divided into five companies behind their commanders. Hector and Polydamas stood at the head of the two largest contingents, elite troops eager to break the wall and fight by the ships. Sebriones joined them in command. Hector stationed a lesser man with his chariot. The second company was led by Paris, along with Agenor and Alcathous. Helenus and Diophobus, sons of Priam, led the third contingent, joined by Asius, Hyrtacus's son, whose huge stallions brought him from Arisbe and the river Seleus. Aeneas led the fourth contingent, and Chyses's son, with the sons of Antenor, Archilochus, and Achimus, as his lieutenants. Sarpedon commanded the allies and picked Glaucus and Asteropius as his lieutenants, judging them to be the best next to himself. Sarpedon knew no peer. Massed behind their leather shields, the Trojans attacked, confident that nothing could stop them now from falling on the black ships. All of them followed Polydamus's strategy, except for Asius. This man, Hyrtacus's son, had no intention of leaving his horses behind with his squire, but chariot and all drove toward the ships and to his fate, never in his glory as charioteer to drive back to windy Ilion again with his proud horses. No, his destiny lay on the bronze point of Idomeneus's spear, making for the left wing of the beachhead camp, where the Greeks returning from battle entered with their horses and cars. Asius drove up to the wide gate and found the doors, not yet shut and barred, but held open by men whose comrades were still returning from battle. Asius drove straight for the gates, followed by his howling soldiers, confident that no Greek could keep them from the black ships now. This was all childishness, for at the gates they found two of Greece's finest warriors, Lapith Spearman, one a son of Pyrithus, Polypoetes by name, and the other, Leonteus, a match for brutal Ares himself. They were like a pair of oak trees, planted before the high gates, these two. Trees that withstand wind and rain, day after day, with roots deep and strong. They met Asius's charge without a tremor, these two Lapiths. Trusting the strength of their hands to beat off not only Asius, but all his men too, who were lifting their leather shields high, around their warlord and his captains, Iamenus and Orestes, and Adamus, who was Asius's son, Thoand and Oenamus. The Lapiths had been inside for some time, rousing the Greeks to fight in defense of their ships, but when they saw the Trojans attacking the wall and the Greeks in loud retreat, they rushed out to fight in front of the gate. They fought like a pair of wild boars, holding off men and dogs in the mountains. Slanting in, they slashed through trees, cutting them off at the root, and the clushing, clashing noise of their tusks rises above the general tumult until someone gets lucky with a spear. The polished bronze clashed on the Lapith's chests as they took hits face on from the enemy. They fought strongly, confident in their might and in the support from those on the wall above who rained down stones from the fortifications in defense of their own lives, their huts, and their seafaring ships. The stones fell like snow down to the ground, falling, falling, like flakes. A cold wind from the shadowy clouds drives thick and fast upon the bountiful earth. Not only stones, but everything that is thrown by men in a war, 
a steady stream of missiles flowed from the hands of Greeks and Trojans alike. Helmets and bossed shields rang hoarsely, like bells struck by rough stones. And Aseus, son of Hyrtacus, groaned, smacked his thighs, and like a man who has been wronged, spoke. Father Zeus, or should I call you the arch-deceiver? I never thought the Greeks had a chance against us. They're like a swarm of wasps or bees, holed up in a hive they had built near a trail through cliffs, and defending their young against hunters. These men, even though they are only two, will not yield the gate until they are killed, or they kill. These words had no effect upon the mind of Zeus, who had decided to give all the glory to Hector. Other battles were being fought around other gates. Even if I were a god, I could not tell you all. Suffice it to say, there was a firestorm of stone all around the wall, that the Greeks were hard-pressed to defend their ships, and that those gods who abetted the Greeks were sorely distressed. Over on the left, the Lapiths were fighting. Polypoides, Pyrithus' son, threw his spear through the bronze cheek piece of Damasus' helmet. The point splintered the bone and scrambled the gray stuff inside. He had been eager to fight. Polypoides killed Pylon and Orminus next. Leontius, meanwhile, was doing his own damage, hitting Hippomachus in the belt with his spear, then darting through the crowd with sword drawn and stabbing Antiphates in close fighting, sending him sprawling backward on the ground. Then, in order, he brought Menon, Iamenus, and Orestes down to Earth's bounty. While the Lapiths stripped their victim's bronze, the troops with Hector and Polydamus, for all their numbers and valor, and their eagerness to break through the wall and fight by the ships, hesitated on the brink of the trench. Paralyzed by an omen, an eagle overhead that skirted their front lines from right to left, clutching in its talons a huge scarlet snake. Still alive and with plenty of fight left, curling around, the snake struck at the eagle just below its neck, and in a spasm of pain, the great bird dropped it in the Trojan ranks and flew off shrieking on a blast of wind. The soldiers shuddered at the glistening coils lying in their midst, a portent from heaven. Polydamus turned to Hector and said, Hector, you always lay into me in assembly, even when I give sound advice, since it will not do for a man of the people to cross you in council or in battle, instead of adding to your strength. Even so, I will speak now as seems best to me. We should not fight the Danans for their ships. It will turn out for us just as with this bird that came to the Trojans as they were eager to cross. It skirted their front lines from right to left, clutching in its talons a huge scarlet snake, but then let it fall before reaching its nest, and never brought it home to give to its young. It will be the same with us, even if our forces break through the Greek wall and its gates, and the enemy falls back, we will find ourselves beating a disorderly retreat from the ships, and leaving behind us many Trojans, killed by the Achaeans in defense of their ships. This is how a soothsayer would respond, one who knows omens well and has the people's trust. Hector's bronze mask leaned toward Polydamus. I don't like the way you're talking now. You know how to speak better than this, but if you really mean what you say, the gods themselves must have addled your wits, telling me to ignore what thundering Zeus has assented to and held out to me. Birds? You want me to obey birds, Polydamus? I don't care which way birds fly, right to the sunrise or left into the dusk. All we have to do is obey great Zeus. Lord of mortals and immortals alike. One omen is best, 
to fight for your country. Why should you be afraid of combat? Even if all the rest of us are killed at the Argive ships, you will be safe since you don't have an ounce of fight in you. But if I catch you holding back from battle or talking anybody else out of fighting, you lose your life on the point of my spear. And he led them across the trench. To the noise of their advance, Zeus now added a wind from Ida's mountains that blew dust straight at the ships and the bewildered Greeks. The sky god was giving the glory to the Trojans and to Hector. Trusting these portents and their own strength, the Trojans did their best to breach the wall. Pulling down pickets and battlements, they threw them to the ground and set to work prying up the huge beams the Greeks had used to reinforce the wall. They were dragging these out, hoping to topple the entire structure, but even then the Greeks refused to give way, patching the battlements with bullhide and beating off the invaders. Both Ajaxes were on the wall, patrolling it and urging on the troops, using harsh words, gentle words, whatever it took to get the men back into the fight. Friends, and I mean everyone from heroes to camp followers, no one ever said men are equal in war. There is work for us all. You know it yourselves. I don't want a single man to return to the ships now that you have heard the rallying cry. Keep the pressure on. Olympian Zeus may still grant us to drive the enemy back to the city. And they roused the Greeks to battle. Snow flurries fall thick on a winter's day when Zeus in his cunning rouses himself to show humans the ammunition he has. He lulls the winds and he snows and snows until he has covered all the mountain tops, headlands and meadows and men's plowed fields, and the snow falls over the harbors and the shores of the gray sea, and only the waves keep it off. The rest of the world is enveloped in the winter tempest of Zeus. The stones flew thick upon the Trojans and upon the Greeks, and the wooden wall was beaten like a drum along its whole length. For all this, though, Hector and his Trojans would never have broken the barred gate had not Zeus roused his own son, Sarpedon, against the Greeks as a lion against cattle. Sarpedon held before him a perfect shield, its bronze skin hammered smooth by the smith, who had stitched the leather beneath with gold all around the rim. Holding this shield and brandishing two spears, Sarpedon advanced. The mountain lion was, has not fed for days, and is hungry and brave enough to enter the stone sheep pen and attack the flocks. Even if he finds herdsmen on the spot, with dogs and spears to protect the fold, he will not be driven back without a try, and either he leaps in and seizes a sheep, or is killed by a spear, as human heroes are. Godlike Sarpedon felt impelled to rush the wall and tear it down. He turned to Glaucus and said, Glaucus, you know how you and I have the best of everything in Lycia. Seats, cuts of meat, full cups, everybody looking at us as if we were gods, not to mention our estates on the Xanthus, fine orchards and riverside wheat fields. Well, now we have to take our stand at the front, where all the best fight and face the heat of battle, so that many an armored Lycian will say, so they're not inglorious after all, our Lycian lords who eat fat sheep and drink the sweetest wine. No, they're strong and fight with our best. Ah, my friend, if you and I could only get out of this war alive and then be immortal and ageless all of our days, I would never again fight among the foremost or send you into battle where men win glory. But as it is, Death is everywhere. 
in more shapes than we can count. And since no mortal is immune or can escape, let's go forward, either to give glory to another man or get glory from him. Thus Sarpedon, Glaucus nodded, and the two of them moved out at the head of a great nation of Lycians. Menestheus, Petios' son, saw them and shuddered, for they were advancing toward his part of the wall and bringing ruin with them. Menestheus looked along the wall for a Greek captain who would be able to avert this disaster. He saw both Ajaxes, who never seemed to tire, and Teucer, who had just come from his hut. They were near enough, but there was no way to make a shout reach them, not with all the noise filling the air, the crash of shields and helmets, and the pounding on the gates, which were all closed now, and before each one of which the enemy stood, trying their best to break them and enter. So Menestheus turned to the herald, Thootes. Run, Thootes, and call Ajax, or better yet, call both of them! All hell is going to break loose here! The Lycian leaders are bearing down on us, and they've been awfully tough in the big battles. If the fighting is too heavy for them both to come, at least get Telamonian Ajax here, and Teucer, too, who is good with a bow. And the herald was off, running along the wall, until he came to the two Ajaxes, to whom he said, My lords Ajax, captains of the Achaeans, the son of Petios, nurtured of Zeus, bids you come make a stand, however briefly, in the battle there. Both of you would be best, since all hell is going to break loose there. The Lycian leaders are bearing down on us, and they've been awfully tough in the big battles. If the fighting is too heavy for both of you to leave, at least let Telamonian Ajax come, and Teucer too, who is good with a bow. Telamonian Ajax heard the herald out, and said to his Aeolian counterpart, Ajax, stay here with Lysomedes and keep these Danans in the fight. I'm going to make a stand over there. When I've helped them out, I'll come back here. Big Ajax left, and with him Teucer, his natural brother, and Pandion, who carried Teucer's curved bow, Moving along the inside of the wall, they came to Menestheus' sector, and to men hard-pressed. The Lycians were swarming up the battlements like black wind. The Greeks pushed back with a shout. In the combat that ensued, it was Telamonian Ajax who first killed his man, Sarpedon's comrade Epicles hitting him with a jagged piece of marble that lay on top of the heap of stones inside the wall there. You couldn't find a man alive now who could lift that stone with both hands, but Ajax swung it high and hurled it with enough force to shatter the four-horned helmet and crush Epicles' skull inside. He fell as if he were doing a high dive from the wall, and his spirit left his bones. Then Teucer hit a fast-charging Glaucus with an arrow, where he saw his arm exposed. This stopped him cold, and he leapt back from the wall, hiding his wound from Greek eyes and his pride from their taunts. It pained Sarpedon to see Glaucus withdraw, but it didn't take away any of his fight. He hit Al Alimeon, son of Thester, with his spear, jabbing it in, and as he pulled it out again, Alcamon came forward with it, falling headfirst and landing with a clatter of finely tooled bronze. Sarpedon wrapped his hands around the battlement and pulled. The whole section gave way, exposing the wall above and making an entrance for many. Ajax and Teucer attacked him together. Teucer's arrow hit his shield's bright belt, where it slung across his chest, but Zeus beat off the death spirits. He would not allow his son to fall by the ships. Big Ajax leapt upon him at the same moment, 
thrusting his spear into Sarpedon's shield, but could not push the point through. He did make him reel backward, though. Sarpedon collected himself a short distance back from the wall. He was not giving up. His heart still hoped to win glory here. Wheeling around, he called to his godlike Lycians. Lycians, why are you slacking off from the fight? Do you think I can knock this wall down alone and clear a path to the ships? Help me out here! The more men we have, the better the work will go! The Lycians cowered before their warlord's rebuke, then tightened the ranks around him even more. The Greeks strengthened their positions on the wall and steeled themselves for a major battle. For all the strength, the Lycians were unable to break the wall, nor could the Greek spearmen push them back once they were close in. They fought at close quarters, like two men disputing boundary stones in a common field and defending their turf with the measuring rods they had brought with them to stake their claims. Likewise, the Trojans and the Greeks, separated by the palisade and reaching over it to hack away at each other's leather shields. Many were wounded, mostly those who turned their unprotected backs to the enemy, but many threw their shields too, until the whole wooden wall dripped with the blood of soldiers from both sides. But the Trojans could do nothing to drive the Greeks back. An honest woman who works with her hands to bring home a meager wage for her children will balance a weight of wool in her scales until both pans are perfectly level. So too, this battle, until Zeus exalted Priam's son Hector first to penetrate the Achaean wall, his shout split the air. Move, Trojans! Let's tear down this Greek fence and make a bonfire out of their ships! They heard him, all right, and swarmed right up the wall, climbing to its pickets with spears in their hands, while Hector scooped up a stone that lay by the gates, a massive boulder tapering to a point. It would take two men to heave it onto a cart, more than two as men are now, but Hector handled it easily alone. Zeus lightened it for him, so that the stone was no more to Hector than the fleece of a ram is to a shepherd who carries it easily in his free hand. This was how Hector carried it up to the gates, a set of heavy double doors, solidly built and bolted shut by interlocked inner bars. Standing close to these towering doors, Hector spread his feet to get his weight behind the throw and smashed the stone right into the middle. The hinges broke off, and the stone's momentum carried it through, exploding the doors and sending splintered wood in every direction. Hector jumped through, a spear in each hand. His face was like sudden night, and a dark gold light played about the armor that encased his zealous bones. No one could have stopped him, except the gods. In his immortal leap through the ruined gate, and his eyes glowed with fire. Wheeling around in the throng, Hector called to his Trojans, who needed no persuasion to scale the wall. Those who couldn't swarmed through the gate, and the Greeks, in rout to their hollow ships, with a noise like the damned stampeded into hell.